Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review of Carving a Statue by Graham Greene. This is the Penguin Plays edition. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. It takes the form of three acts, but each act is only one scene. Dane reads... So we've got Carving a Statue, Graham Greene's most controversial play, explores the lack of relationship between a sculptor of great ambition and no talent, who is obsessed with creating a statue of God the Father, and his son, who must learn to lead his own life. In The New Statesman, Ronald Bryden wrote, People go on complaining about the untheatricality of Graham Greene's excursions into the theatre. Hasn't it struck anyone that, straying in from his own field, the greatest contemporary novelist might have something else more interesting to offer? Carving a statue lacks lots of things which make a good play, but it brings to the theatre a wit and intelligence few playwrights would dare, and the immense generosity of a great moral writer. And, um... I would agree with that. I, I mean, I thought it was really beautifully written. I can see why it's not considered maybe to be like theatrical. Um, it could have been a short story as, as, as much as it is a play, um, but I did enjoy it. Graham Greene is one of my favourite writers. Uh, it says here, Carving a Statue, produced by Peter Wood, with scenery by Desmond Healy, was first presented at the Haymarket Theatre London on 17th of September 1964 with the following cast. So we have the father, Ralph Richardson, his son, Dennis Waterman, the first girl, Barbara Ferris, the second girl, Jane Birkin, and Dr. Parker was Roland Culver. Um, so some big names in that as well. So for, for most of this, what I've tabbed out actually, oh, well, I mean, obviously it's a play, so it's dialogue, um, but a lot of like, soliloquies and stuff I thought were great. So uh, the father says, I only have to carve what shows. All the same, how do you carve a contradiction? He has to be wicked and he has to be loving at the same time. And he can't suffer or he wouldn't have sent his son down here to die. He wiped out the whole world except Noah without blinking one stony eyelid. The Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea like so many Chinamen. Of course I can understand his attitude. I wouldn't exactly suffer if I broke him up with a crowbar. I would be free of him as he was free of his son. I suppose I'd feel a bit of waste, that's all. I've been at him now for 15 years. Perhaps he felt the same after all the centuries when the atom bombs dropped or the plays came and the earthquakes. A sense of waste, yes, but I wouldn't go so far as to say he suffered. And so um, he's talking here about the process of um, getting models for his sculptures. He says, women exaggerate. I tried some models for the father. For example, Mr. Muggeridge at 27 Nell Gwynn Avenue, but he couldn't sit still for more than half an hour without a cigar in his mouth. God, the father with a cigar, it wasn't suitable. Then there was Henry Tomlinson from Elm Park Road. I was getting on well with him in charcoal. He had a kind of patient expression, unlike Muggeridge. But then all the rumours reached me. It was said he wasn't a father at all. His wife had been carrying on for years with Mr Watkins of the Midland Bank. So I thought of trying Watkins instead, but the situation was delicate. It was then I thought of photos. That's been done before by painters. Sickert, for example. He was not a man of my ambition, but you can learn from lesser men. All right, so here we have the opening to act number two. And we get this great exchange. So the boy brings a uh, girl back to the uh, studio. And this girl goes, I'm not afraid of the old boy. I don't like scenes, that's all. They're crummy. God almighty, what's this? God almighty. I just thought that, yeah, this was relatable as well. The father's looking at the statue and he goes, I did those feet before I did anything else. Sometimes I'm afraid they're the best things I've ever done or I'm ever likely to do. And I think that's just a general thing as an artist or a creative. You're constantly kind of second guessing yourself and being like, have I already peaked, you know? A great line here. Uh, if there are enough prayers, some will be answered. It's the law of averages. Very true. And then Dr. Parker, he's a great uh, little character, and he's, he's got this monologue here that I'm going to read out. I'll have to do the stage instructions as well, I suppose. So he enters. Well, we get outside, there is a crash and an oath. She retreats towards the wall where she stands in shadow behind the statue. An elderly, too dapper man wearing a dark formal hat and a dark formal suit carrying a dark formal briefcase hops onto the stage from the right, Dr. Parker. He puts his leg gingerly down. You ought to get that lino repaired. He feels his kneecap. There's nothing like hitting the kneecap to convince a man that he exists. He hops down the stairs to the foot of the ladder and stares up. You're the lucky one, no knees at all. Perhaps not so lucky. You lack more essential features too. You think me lacking in respect, but you're not in a church yet. Talking aloud to myself, I'm quite aware of the fact. I do it quite deliberately. Why should it be thought eccentric to talk to oneself? It's an enormous relief after talking to less intelligent people all day. My first appointment was at 9.30 and except for lunchtime, I have not been alone since then for two minutes. As for lunchtime, I can hardly talk to myself at meals or I should never finish the meal. So at lunch, I listened only to my unspoken thoughts. That's no relief at all. I am a listener all day as it is, God pity me. He looks up at the statue, if you'll excuse the expression. He sits down on the statue's feet. He pulls up his trouser leg and examines his knee with his fingers. The patella is quite undamaged. 
Apply a little Elements Embrication, the strong veterinary variety, rubbing it gently in after warming the bottle. However, now that I have you here, at my mercy, ha, let's make a more complete examination. After the age of 65, one should be examined regularly. As a precaution only, no cause for alarm. You are obviously in perfect health. Leaving his trouser leg still tucked above his knee, he opens his briefcase and pulls out the rubber band used for testing blood pressure. Supposed to be the latest model. Of course, the Japs are ahead of us as always. Ugly little brutes, but inventive. You can't deny that. Those lonely bachelor boxes they used to sell at Kyoto. Obviously, I don't condone the casual races in there. He pulls up his sleeve and wraps the band around his arm. Then he blows it up and checks the pulse beat with his watch. 110. Not bad for a man of my age. A little low, perhaps, but a fault on the right side. I wouldn't hesitate to let myself know at once if it were otherwise. What a joy it is to treat a patient without having to employ a bedside manner. I have the courage to tell myself the truth. He rolls up the apparatus and puts it back in the briefcase. Absent-mindedly, he leaves his left sleeve rolled up as well as his right trouser leg. A bedside manner is a thing that slowly, inevitably destroys a man. A doctor may be clever, charming, assiduous. He may be loved by his patients, but he belongs to a world of fantasy. After telling a lot of frightened patients a lot of reassuring stories, I find it hard to believe in my own reality. I tell little jokes. What is the difference between an elephant and a flea? As I feel the cruel tumour under my fingers. He pats the statue. My friend, I become like you, a block of stone indifferent to human suffering. The thought of you soothes the dying, just so they wait for my footsteps. Like you, I offer false comfort. What other use have you? Can you tell the difference between an elephant and a flea? Can you tell me that? I ask you and you don't answer. I implore you. This comedy has got to end or I shall turn serious. And uh, just this final little sol soliloquy here by the father I wanted to share. I'm tired of him. Tired, tired. That means I'm tired of everything. You think I own those blocks of stone? I bought them years ago in Joss's Barrow's yard at a cheap rate because he was bankrupt. Like the man in the story who bought an old lamp at a sale and when he polished it he thought he owned the gin who came out of the lamp. This is my gym. He's taken everything from me, even my evening glass of beer. If I'm not careful, so Dr. Parker hints, he'll take my life too. I hate him and yet he's all I have. If I haven't worked at him enough during the day, I can't sleep. And when I've worked, I wake in the morning and I know what I've done is wrong. He owns my sleep and he poisons it with dreams. He gives me ideas and when I follow them, he gives a sneer of stone. I'm wrong again. A woman who lives with a parrot grows a parrot's beak. A man becomes his work. Watch Mr. Watkins of the Midland Bank when he drinks his tea. It's as though he were ladling cash with his brass scoop into a drawer. You almost hear the money chink. And I just think again, if you're a creator, you'll kind of see a bit of yourself there. So yeah, Carving a Statue by Graham Greene. It's quite a simple story, quite engrossing. There is a big twist at the end that I don't want to spoil for you guys. I would recommend reading the play if you get a chance and also going to see it. I gave it a four out of five, but then I am a little bit biased because Graham Greene's one of my favorite authors. So there we have it, that's what I made of Carving a Statue by Graham Greene. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.